<clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> we're actually going back to chapter 9, because the gods of the college board have decided that fluids belongs in AP Physics 2 for some reason. So you're going to find it's um, <clears throat> very tightly related <clears throat> to the mechanics stuff that we know. Although it's really kind of its own subject uh, as well. A little bit of both. We're not doing the solid stuff. It's nothing wrong with it. It's just not on the AP test. And time is short. Um, I highly recommend reading the chapter, especially if you're going to be an engineer. Materials science is super important to it. And um, it's not too hard a chapter. In just a few sections. Um, all right. Density is the... The one subject, the one word, the one concept that seems to pervade all three of the major sciences. You get it in chemistry, you get it in biology, and you get it in physics. Um, kind of an important idea, so you know it already. Density of a substance is its mass divided by its volume. We actually talked about densities of all kinds of things, but um, the word density by itself is reserved for mass density. We don't even say mass density. Um, the letter rho for a three-dimensional mass density, which is all you have in the real world. Um, we sometimes fake it and we'll have linear densities or area densities. Um, but the one that's more correct is mass over volume. Units for that are kilograms per meter squared. There's no nickname for some reason. And, yeah, the SI units, the CGS, which are um, centimeters, grams, seconds, or grams per centimeter cubed. Shocking. All right, brand new um, idea involving density, but to probably you've never heard of. It's called specific gravity, but it's super easy. Um, it has only one weirdness to it, one strange thing about it. Um, you take the ratio of an object's density compared to the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. Why 4 degrees Celsius? I guess that's the temperature it was on the guy on the day the guy who did this made it up. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> wrong. Wrong. Um, the reason it's 4 degrees Celsius is to make it easy for you. The density of water when it's 4 degrees Celsius is exactly 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, which was why they showed you that last slide, which was... Let's go back to it. 1 gram per centimeter cubed. So that is to help you find the specific gravity. So they're not even teaching you density. For density's sake, you know that already, but for this idea of specific gravity. So comparing the density to the density of water becomes important. If it has a density that is less than water, it will float on water. If it has a density that is more than water, it will not. Um, the temperature only matters if those two objects are at a drastically different temperature from each other. All right pressure. Um, kind of a new concept for us. It's a simple mathematical one though. You take the force, any force actually, divided by the area that that force is applied. So um, the pressure when someone punches you in the face, hope that doesn't happen, um, is the area of the fist divided by the force that the fist takes. Whereas if somebody jabs you with a pencil, um, the pressure is much higher, even if the force is the same, you're, it's much more dangerous because you're, you're dividing that force over a much smaller area, right? Um, dangerous. Okay. Didn't mean to make this a weapons class. Um, all right, so here, the pressure underwater, let's say you get submerged underwater, you take the total force divided by the total surface area of you. Much harder to calculate the surface area of you, um, but it turns out the pressure in terms of a fluid, is only really related to the depth that you're at. Um, so we're going to take a simple shape to do the areas on, and that's a cube, right? So we take this imaginary cube of water, and the pressure that's on the water that's inside our cube <clears throat> from the pressure of the water that's outside the cube, um, you're going to see is only a function of depth, and that'll, so it'll apply to any object regardless of its shape. You just need to know where, where the depth is of that object. <clears throat> But pressure in general is defined to be force divided by area. And for our SI units, Newton per meter squared, um, that has a nickname, thanks to somebody named uh, Pascal. Uh, Blaise Pascal, I think his first name was. So a Pascal, a capital P and a lowercase a, because of the man's name, um, is for pressure. Um, got lucky with the two letters lining up a little bit. Okay, so... 
If you take, you're not underwater now, you're just sitting on a table, you rest a cube that's two meters by two meters by two meters, right? And you rest it um, on a table and it has a mass of 50 kilograms. Notice it's been a while, that's its mass, not its weight, right? Weight is the force of gravity. So how much pressure does the cube exert on the floor? So here's um, what we've discovered. If you have a fluid at rest in a container, we're going to do fluid statics to begin with. It means it's not moving, right? Um, so all por por portions of the fluid must be in static equilibrium. Well, you know that equilibrium means that the sum of the forces on the object are zero, but static equilibrium it just adds to that that it's not moving, right? If an object doesn't have any forces on it, it could still be moving at a constant velocity, but in this case, not moving. So we have um, uh, water that is not moving. All points at the same depth, we're going to find that they're at the same pressure. If not, you look at the picture from before, if the pressure was more left than right, or the pressure was more up than down, or the pressure was more this way than this way, then the force, because the area is the same, this, this imaginary object that we picked was a cube, right? If the force was more this way than this way, that would mean the pressure was more this way than this way. And if you have more force um, more in the x than the negative x, it doesn't add up to zero, and it begins to move. And we are defining the situation to be <clears throat> that the fluid isn't moving. Um, so that would cause f um, fluid flow from the high pressure area to the low pressure area. Eventually we'll, we'll let that happen, but it's not happening yet. So here's our imaginary cube or, or rectangular surface, right? <clears throat> now that... Um, cube of water, that, that uh, rectangle of water, um, has a certain height. And what you're going to discover is the pressure at the top of the object and the pressure at the bottom of the object are different. The reason we know they are different is because they have weight. We have already um, predicated, I guess is the word, we've already said in advance that this cube is not moving. That means the forces left and right are the same, the forces in and out are the same. So the forces up and down must also be the same, but down has a special force added, which is mg, right? So the pressure on the top plus the weight of the object has to equal the second pressure. So there's a difference in pressure. The pressure on the bottom of the object is a little bit different because it has to hold up the weight of the object, and that's the secret, that's the key to this, um, to these conclusions. So this darker area is just part of the fluid, and it's an imaginary box we've outlined it with, but it has a weight, and that weight has to be suspended by the fluid that is below it, and so the force comes coming from the fluid below it and behaves as a pressure. <clears throat> There's a force per area on whatever that shape is. So with some pretty easy calculation, we can find the difference in the pressures, right? PA1 plus MG equals PA2. Now, here's the secret. <coughs> the water's in equilibrium. <coughs> the secret is whenever we do pressure stuff, whenever we do fluid stuff, we never talk about the mass of an object. In fact, all of your, you're used to using mass. You're used to using the weight of an object and the mass of an object. So every time you would use the mass of an object, we're going to use the density of an object. So we're going to take some formulas that you're familiar with, divide them by volume on each both sides of the equation, and all of the masses become densities. Then it'll look very similar. We'll look at the... Um, the gravitational potential energy, but in terms of rho, in terms of density. We'll look at the kinetic energy, but in terms of rho, in terms of density. Any formula where you would have had a mass in it, we're going to divide by volume um, both sides of the equation and become rows instead of masses, okay? <coughs> so m is rho times v, right? So we will have m... Uh, what are we looking at here? So rho times v. Oh, okay. So we have this this cube, right? The volume of this is the area on the bottom times its height, right? As a, as a little cubic thing. That's why they didn't make it a cube. They made it a, a long rectangle. But the they had the area on the bottom and the height together give you volume. The base times the height for a cubic solid. So now, how do the pressures compare? We're going to con convert m to rho h, right? So the pressure, <clears throat> wherever you are, is equal to the pressure, and now at the top of the surface, let's go to what the, the pressure is just at the top, and the pressure here, 
at the top of your fluid has to be the same as the air pressure. Otherwise, if there were more pressure from below, that water would come shooting up. And if it does, it would rise up, and it does. It rises up until they bounce, right? So this row zero now is the row of your air, the density of the air. Not the row, it's not a row, it's a P zero, it's pressure zero. Got to keep those two separate. So the pressure of the air plus the density of the liquid times gravitational constant times H is now the depth you are underwater. That's the pressure at that depth. That's how we measure pressure. So it's all stuff that you know with a few new definitions, right? <clears throat> so P zero is normal atmospheric pressure. And we're going to use 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Seldom do you use the 0 0.013, but you can. Um, just don't forget the 10 to the 5. That is normal atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure on you right now as you're watching this video um, at sea level. We're pretty close to sea level. Um, does not depend on the, on the shape of the container. If you look in the picture, it doesn't matter whether you're in the wide part here or down in the pipe. All that matters is your actual depth. So right here, you measure the depth below um, the air, where the air meets the container. So it's the atmospheric pressure plus rho GH. You're going to see rho GH a lot. All right, so the density of water we define to be 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed at 4 Celsius. We'll pretend it's 4 Celsius. And we want to know it doesn't change much. It changes very, very slowly with temperature. Um, <clears throat> How many atmospheres of pressure would you feel if you were a thousand feet underwater? So now you're looking for a multiple of P0, okay? You don't have to put P0 in, or you're going to divide out P0, right? How many atmospheres? How many times um, outside air atmospheric pressure would you have at a thousand meters underwater? All right, we're going to have three names in this chapter that are very important, and you actually have to know their names. That's really never happened before in any of these units. You have to know their names, and you have to know the rules that go with them, because they're identified by their names. Uh, the first guy is Pascal. So, Pascal's principle. Um, if you apply a change to the pressure on one part of a liquid, that pressure is very quickly, um, at the speed of sound actually, transmitted to all of the other parts of the container. So here's this lid, this stopper is movable. If I press down on that, that causes the entire thing um, to move. Um, the word fluid um, actually just means a moving um at a, a moving material. So both liquids and gases are fluid. So if you've ever blown up a balloon, you'll see that it, it changes shape very regularly, right? You can't, usually doesn't uh, move more on one side than the other. Um, if it does, that means the material has, has some weaknesses, and, but the pressure is still the same everywhere. This allows us to do some neat stuff. Um, this is a hydraulic press, and it's a classic example of this, and it's one that they'll use quite a bit. So we've got in here a hydraulic fluid, um, some sort of oil usually, something that's viscous and um, stable. And then you put a couple of pistons on it, one that has a small area and one that has a big area. It's the area that matters here. And you press down F1 times delta x1. So actually this is a question of energy. F times D is the amount of work that you do. And you're going to get out the same energy that you put in. However, F times D here um, is, going, is going to be the same, but you've got different areas involved, right? So what happens is the pressure is the same in both places. And so um, F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. The reason this happens is because of the conservation of energy, because of work. But you, the the um, that stuff sort of cancels out, and you can just worry about the force difference between the two. It is inversely proportional to the area that you have. So a very small force can be turned into a very large force. You can lift a car with just your finger. If you have a, lots of hydraulic fluid and a very... Um, different difference in area, and the amount that you push down is very different than the amount that it goes up, right? 